today we are going to have in the morning a tutorial uh, about geometric models for data analysis, which is going <coughs> to be divided in two parts. The first part is going to be in charge of uh, Frederick Casal. Uh, he's from INRIA. And well, all yours. OK, thank you. Ah, thank, like thank you very much. So indeed, so in fact, we'll be giving two lectures with uh, Steve Udo, who's sitting over there, a colleague of mine from INRIA also. And actually, I, if I understand well, this is not strictly related to uh, biomedical image processing, yet these are fundamental topics uh, of broad interest. So, and in fact, so I'll be talking about uh, algorithm for searching nearest neighbors in Euclidean and metric spaces, and which could be used to, for example, compare images, uh, retrieve uh, images, uh, neighbors of a given query image, or for example, to query databases of organs, should you be interested in such models. And Steve will be speaking about uh, sig signatures for geometric shapes, right? So even if you're not strictly speaking interested in these topics, I think these are algorithms which, are, which should be of interest for your research. Okay, so <coughs> here is the outline of my talk. So I'll be, for example, to begin with, I'll be presenting an introduction to just to state what the topic is about. And then I'll be covering a, a simple, versatile, and very efficient solution for spotting nearest neighbors, KD trees, and uh, actually variants uh, of such uh, data structures. So this will be essentially for points sitting in a Euclidean space, right? And then we'll be switching to the more general case where one is given a database of objects for which there is a metric, but there is no clear embedding in a geometric space, right? So in other words, here we'll be talking about shapes for which we know how to compute the distance, but we don't know how to embed them in Euclidean space. And actually, I'll be talking about metric trees, which generalize KD trees in a very simple and elegant manner, right? Okay, and then I'll be switching to um, an interesting uh, metric to compare shapes known as actually the earth mover distance. And this is actually coming from optimal transportation theory. And uh, I'll show you how, to, how this can be computed. I also bridge the gap to statistics. I'll be showing in a couple of slides that this is actually also related to the so-called Mallow distance, which is a measure to uh, compare actually distributions. Okay. And then finally, this will be a kind of warning, uh, especially for those of you working in high dimensional spaces. I'll show you that actually in high dimensional spaces, distances tend to concentrate, and in fact, the higher the dimension, the less meaningful the, the notion of distance, unless one is really careful. So in other words, if you're, if you're interested in shapes which live in a high dimensional space, computing distances actually may not make so much sense, right? Okay, so this is the outline. <coughs> okay, so the introduction, <coughs> so, so I, I could run a, a simple poll here. So how many of you already face the problem of uh, running nearest neighbor queries in some space? So let's just to, to get a glimpse of, yeah, so quite a few, maybe one third of the audience, okay? <coughs> so of course you may have faced this issue for a number of problems. For example, if you want to, to run some clustering algorithm, so typically you know to figure out for a given point. So yeah, essentially uh, I'll be, when I'll be saying a point, so this means the coding of an object, right? So, for example, the vector of the features which are describing the object. So if you want to run a clustering algorithm, for example, k-means or uh, whatever algorithm, so typically you need to compute distances between, between points, coding objects. And so for that, uh, you'd better do it in, an, in a smart fashion. Uh, namely, you'd better do something more efficient than the naive search which consists for a given uh, point uh, of computing the, the nearest neighbor in a, by, by, by a linear scan over your database, right? So of course, uh, if you want to specifically report the neighbors of a point, you will also have to run nearest neighbor queries. So in, in information theory, if you want to quantize uh, points, so you, these algorithms are going to show up too, in classification and in learning theory and so on and so forth. So really these algorithms are found pretty much anywhere in computer science. Okay. So here is maybe <coughs> the simplest uh, example one can give. It's about uh, actually processing a point cloud in a Euclidean space. So here uh, we'll be talking, uh, I lost my pointer, okay. So we have a point cloud P, which is sitting in RD here, and we have a query point Q, okay. So these are, these, these are my points, the black bullets in uh, R2 here. 
I have a query point, this square here, and I want to find the nearest neighbor, which is this guy here. So <coughs> prosaically, what you may do here, you, you may grow a ball center on Q, and of course, the first point you're going to hit is going to be your nearest neighbor, right? Okay. This is what <coughs> the kind of problem we want to solve, but of course, for actually general shapes. So uh, how come? Ah. Okay. So <coughs> in order to solve this kind of problem, there is a fundamental data structure, which is known as the Voronoi diagram. And the Voronoi diagram has a dual structure, which is known as the DNA triangulation. So <coughs> in case you have never found, encountered this kind of data structure, let me tell you how this is computed. So we have a point set, okay? So here we have six points, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the Voronoi diagram is the, the guy uh, depicted in solid line here, right? So um, <coughs> to plot the Voronoi diagram, actually what we are doing, we are, we are plotting pieces of bisectors between selected pairs of points, right? So for example, between these two points, I'm going to plot this piece of bisector, which is a subdivision of the plane into two half spaces. Uh, on the left-hand side here, these are the points which are sitting nearest to this one. And on the right-hand side, these are the points of the plane sitting nearest to this one, right? Okay. And uh, by doing this for the relevant pair of points, uh, we end up with a partition of R2 into regions. And as you can see, what's important in the Voronoi diagram is to understand that this is really a partition of the entire space. So if we are co concentrating on this open set, which is two-dimensional here, these are the points which have exactly one nearest neighbor, namely this one, right? Okay. So now, if I'm focusing on the relative interior from a topological standpoint, the relative interior of the line, line segment here, so these are the points in R2 which have exactly two nearest neighbors, namely this one and that one, right? And now, uh, if we are concentrating on this point here, this guy has exactly three nearest neighbors, one, two, three, right? So in other words, if I pick any point in the plane, in fact, this point will, have, will be sitting in an open, relatively open Voronoi cell, and this Voronoi cell is exactly going to tell me how many nearest neighbors this point has, right? And here, I describe the three configuration, generic configurations in R2. So either one nearest neighbor, two nearest neighbors, or here, three Voronoi neighbors. Okay. So this is a Voronoi diagram, a partition of the space into equivalent classes with respect to nearest neighbors. So now, this construction has a dual, which is known as the DNA triangulation. So here is how it works. So <coughs> if we are focusing on a Voronoi cell, so the Voronoi cell has a dual. So by the way, the DNA triangulation, as the name suggests, is a triangulation, or more generally, a simplicial complex. So a simplicial complex is a Lego of simplices. So a zero simplex is a vertex, a one simplex is an edge, a two simplex is a triangle, and so on and so forth. Then we move to tetrahedra and so on and so forth, right? Okay, so let me tell you how one builds the DNA triangulation from the Voronoi diagram. If we have one vertex here in the Voronoi diagram, so this guy he, here actually, it will have, it, as I said, it has three nearest neighbors, one, two, three, and I'm, go I'm going to take the convex cell of these three neighbors, and this is going to define a triangle in the DNA triangulation. Right? If we take this Voronoi edge, or maybe this one, right, and it has two neighbors, this one and that one, and if we now take the convex cell of these two points, we have one edge in the DNA triangulation. Okay? And now if we take this region here, a single nearest neighbor, this one, whence the vertex in the DNA triangulation. And so overall, the DNA triangulation is a set of vertices, the edges, which you see in dashed lines, and the triangles. OK, okay so <coughs> because uh, actually this is describing uh, uh, properties with respect to nearest neighbors, this can be used very easily to find nearest neighbors, right? And so here is a simple way to do it. So if you, if you pick any point, right, so here I call it P, so what you can do uh, Q, sorry, this is point, uh, no, okay, this is my query point Q, the nearest neighbor and then Q here, and I, I, I want to find it from the DNA triangulation or the Voronoi diagram. So what I can do is the following. I pick any point at random in my Voronoi diagram or DNA triangulation. <coughs> Let's assume that we have, uh, as we have seen, it's the same, right, because uh, it's the same. And so what I can do <coughs> for this point P, let's assume this is our starting point, I'm going to collect the neighbors in the DNA triangulation, the dashed lines on the previous line, or equivalently, I'm going to collect the neighbors from the Voronoi diagram, namely the points 
for which the two Voronoi cells are incident, namely they share a Voronoi edge, right? And then what I'm going to do is to, 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 to try to check whether point P has a neighbor which is nearest to Q than P, right? And so here, for example, this one. And I'm going to iterate until actually uh, I hit a fixed point, right? Namely, point P is the nearest neighbor of point Q. Okay, so there is a simple argument. Uh, I give you the slide so you will be able to, to go through the argument showing that actually this works. This is a valid uh, guess for the nearest neighbor. And so, <coughs> as you can see from this simple algorithm, if you have this construction, you are done. Uh, I'll come back a little bit later and I'll explain you why this is not a valid solution for complex situations. Because essentially, the complexity of Delaunay or Voronoi is exponential in the dimension. So actually, this is appealing from a conceptual standpoint, yet this is not a valid solution if you want to run these algorithms, let's say, beyond dimension maybe five, right? Okay, so <clears throat> now that we have seen an example, so uh, what is so special about nearest neighbors? So what do we want to do? So if we are given a point set P, let's say endpoint in R par D, okay? We want to, to build a data structure, for example, the Voronoi diagram, to, able to, to be able to answer uh, nearest neighbor queries, right? And so ideally, so the data structure should have a linear size, which means that if you have n, uh, n, um, n objects, you, you should use a space, uh, sp memory-wise, which is big O of n, right? So I'll give you examples of data structures which are a little bit more actually complicated. Uh, super linear space, right? And of course, should you run a query, ideally you would like of your query to, to run in, in a time which is negligible with the size of the database, right? So here is a simple way, uh, a simple example. Should you be processing data in uh, one dimensional data, of course, the ideal solution to answer such query, that would be a balanced bin research tree, right? Because such a tree, it has a linear storage, right? It has a height which is uh, logarithmic, and so in order to answer a query, you are going just to descend the tree and that's it. So linear space and log n search time, okay. So of course, as I told you, <coughs> uh, things are more, more difficult than that. And in fact, so typically in R to the D, so um, uh, there is a so-called curse of dimensionality. We'll be hitting this uh, expression later, later today. Uh, so this is one difficulty, building efficient data structures in high dimensional spaces. And the second difficulty I'll be talking about also is the the fact that distances tend to be less and less meaningful when the dimension increases. Okay. Okay, so before talking about complicated structures, so let me point out some trivial solutions. So of course you may have, um, if you store, if each point has D features, so you, if you store them linearly, so you have this, this much storage, and if you are able to, if you are willing to scan the whole database, your search space is going to be this much. But of course, this is not really interesting. You don't speed up, you, you don't have any speed up in doing that. Voronoi diagrams, actually, they are optimal in dimension two, right? Uh, because they take linear space. And uh, <clears throat> in that case, so you can show that queries can be, uh, can be run in log, log n time. But as soon as you go to dimension three or more, actually, the space, spatial requirements become more, more demanding. And so you have this much. And so already in dimension three, you have point sets whose uh, Delaunay triangulation has quadratic size, right? And so if you have a big point cloud, quadratic is probably precluded. Okay, so there are some tricks under some hypotheses. One can do a little bit better, but essentially, so the diagrams do not really help here. Okay. And so what I'll be focusing uh, on in the SQL are spatial partitions based on trees. So if you know this topic, nearest neighbors, you probably know that a lot of research has been done both from the theoretical standpoint and also from the practical standpoint. And so in this talk, I, I try to strike a compromise by presenting data structures which are both efficient uh, practically and which are also amenable to some theoretical analysis to know exactly what, what may happen should you run a query. Okay, so before jumping into the data structures, let me uh, plug a few more comments on some variants. So I told you that essentially we wanted to find the nearest neighbor of a point, but of course uh, you may also uh, be interested in, oops, sorry about that. You may be interested in K nearest neighbors, mm -hmm. okay. You may also be interested in so-called range queries. You are given a number R and you want to find the point in, in P uh, within distance R from your query point Q. So this is also, uh, uh, this is a different kind of query. 
So regarding the metrics, of course, so, so far we essentially talked about the Euclidean distance, but you, you may be interested in different metrics, right? Okay. Uh, so this is essentially in a geometric setting, but should, should you be processing strings, for example, you may care for the Hamming distance. You may also want to define metrics for more complicated shapes, images, graphs, etc. So I'll be presenting one example of such metrics, the earth mover distance. Okay. You may be processing point sets and so on and so forth. So it's the reason why I was saying that this framework is really of broad interest. Okay. And so now if you go to the literature, <coughs> you'll find, as I was saying, so uh, many things have been done. So historically speaking, so people try to generalize uh, binary search trees. And so one stumbles on KD trees and or quad trees, actually. Okay, so I'll be focusing on KD trees. You'll, you'll understand why. <coughs> so now if you want to go, so this is essentially when you can partition the ambient space, right? So you typically you can throw a hyperplane, which is going to divide the ambient space. Uh, so as to generalize uh, actually the median in a, in, in, a, in a point set, right? When you can do that, then one, is, one switches to so-called metric trees where, as I was saying earlier, you have a distance but you don't have any embedding. And so interestingly, met metric trees generalize nicely KD trees, so I'll be presenting these two, okay? You probably also know that there are different, uh, there are alternatives like uh, LSH, locally sensitive hashing, there are data structures based on hierarchical k-means where basically you run k-means once, so you assign points to clusters and you recurse, right? So this is building a tree, uh, which can be used also for nearest neighbor queries, okay? And as I was saying, in fact, I tried to, to so in one hour and a half, I tried to make, I had to make decisions, and so I decided to go for a solution which works well, which can be analyzed. And when I'm saying that it works well, if you try to spot recent papers, so a lot of engineering has been done uh, on this topic too. And so you, you'll find three, four papers trying to compare all solutions. So here is one of them, actually this one, right? So these are two, two, two good examples to, to begin with. And so in this paper, basically you have, they have benchmarked a number of solutions. So here we have k-means, k-means three, right? We have randomized KD trees, which we'll hear about later. We have approximate nearest neighbor, we have locally sensitive, locally sensitive hashing, right? And so these are the names of the databases. And essentially in all these trees, what you find is that, well, in fact, people are not solving the exact nearest neighbor problem. They are willing to accept uh, a neighbor which is a good approximation of the um, uh, exact nearest neighbor, right? And so now if you throw a number of queries, so you're going to compute the number, the, the, the fraction of queries for which you have uh, a solution which is a decent one, and as a function of this, uh, on, as a function of on how demanding you are, you are going to get a running time. And as you can see here, so the, the winners are k-means and um, k-means and randomized KD trees, right? And this is found consistently throughout these papers which have tried to compare solutions, as far as I know. So of course, this may depend on your database. So you may find, you may be able to come up with examples for which uh, LSH or approximate near a neighbor is, uh, A and N is working best. But um, I think this is still something decent to, fair, fair to, to say, namely that uh, such solutions, they are quite uh, actually versatile and robust. Uh, yeah. This method, do you have any, uh, Theoretical complexity bounds on the query. Uh, yeah, for for KD trees, yes. So I'll come. Okay, but for the others, we don't have. No, no, for, for the others too. Yeah. So these are solutions which have been analyzed carefully. So all, all of them actually, except maybe, except maybe K, K, K means three. For all the others, so both the spatial requirements and the complexity of the queries are actually under control. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this was just to motivate the fact that I'll be speaking about KD trees, essentially. Well, for uh, data sitting in a Euclidean space. Okay, so KD trees. So in fact, the, the idea is very simple. So, so I'm sure many of them have uh, already know about KD trees, right? So how many, how many of you? KD trees? Yeah, okay. Okay, so <coughs> a KD tree is a binary tree. So, and any internal node is going to actually implement a spatial partition induced by a hyperplane, right? And what you want to do is to, to split the point cloud into two equal subsets. So basically here, if, <coughs> if I'm projecting my points along the x-axis, right? So I get uh, real valued data. I compute the median, maybe this guy here. And then I'm going to say, okay, 
let me throw uh, uh, a plane perpendicular to the x-axis. I'm going to place it at the median, and in, in this way, actually, I have, of, of course, one point associated with the boundary, this guy, and then I have uh, two point sets of equal size on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And so I'm going to do this recursively, right? Okay. And of course, I may stop the process uh, once uh, on one side of the upper plane, I get, uh, let's say, uh, a bucket of size N0. Okay. So this is the condition to stop the recursion. Okay. So this is, to be a bit more precise, this is the way it works. So, <clears throat> of course, one, the only question here is, how am I going to define this hyperplane? So typically, the simplest way to do it is to iteratively go through the direction. You're going to first you split along the, by throwing a, a hyperplane perpendicular to x, and then perpendicular to y, and then to x, and then to y. Or you may choose, for example, you may split along the direction which is maximizing the variance. So you, you have different ways to do this. But essentially, this is the way it goes, right? So you pick a direction, you project the point onto the direction, you compute the median, so you assign the point which realizes the median to that node, okay? And then uh, you assign points to the left, you assign points to the right, and then you recursively build, actually, the subtrees. Okay, so that's pretty easy. This is a KD tree. So now, more interesting is the way one is going to search a KD tree, because th there are actually three different ways to do this. So <coughs> the first strategy, uh, we typically call it the so-called defeatist search, right? It is very simple, as you're going to see, but it may fail. Mm -hmm. uh, we, by failure here, I mean the, uh, the fact that the algorithm is, is going to return a point which is not the nearest neighbor of the query, okay? But because this is a simple one-way traversal of the tree, it's going to be extremely fast. So then, we have the so-called descending search, which is a search which always succeeds, but which may actually take uh, more time because it's going to, it may discover the nearest neighbor at some early stage, but still, to back up uh, the point which is going to be reported, it's going to run some, some checks, and eventually this may be costly, and so costly that the whole tree may be actually uh, traversed, right? So here it's going to succeed, but in the worst case, uh, the whole tree will actually be explored. Whereas here, of course, we'll have a lo lo logarithmic uh, query time. Okay. And to strike a balance between the definitive search and the descending search, there is a so-called priority search, right? Which is trying to, to get the best of both worlds. Okay, so let's try to, okay, to investigate these three strategies. <coughs> so <coughs> in the definitive search, uh, the idea is to actually visit the subtree recursively containing the query point, right? So you have a query point Q. You say, oh, it's sitting on the left-hand side of my bisector here. Let me visit the left subtree, right? And so on and so forth. Okay, so this is what is here. So you, you pick the root. You compute the distance, actually, to the node which is found in the root. And then one, uh, your node, your current node is not, it's not empty. So if you belong to the left domain, you are going to, uh, to visit actually the left domain. If you, visit, if you belong to the right domain, you visit the right domain. And of course, so here is uh, the complexity here, right? So if you have stopped the recursion process uh, when a uh, region has n not points, so the height of the tree 2 to the edge times n not is equal to n, so the height is log, log, log in base 2 of uh, n divided by n0, okay? And so you, what you are doing here, you, you descend down the tree, once this complexity. If you hit a leaf, you, you have to, to go through a linear scan to investigate all the points stored in that tree. And so this is your search cost, cost which is logarithmic. So now, what is the difficulty here? The difficulty is that you may, at any stage, you may, your decision may be wrong, right? So here is a very simple example. Upon uh, searching the root, actually I'm going to make the wrong decision. Why? Here is my query point Q. Let's assume that I'm growing a ball to spot uh, the nearest neighbor in the wall point cloud. So as you can see, the first point N and Q, N and of Q, which I'm hitting, is located on the right hand side, right? But because I'm sitting on the left hand side of the boundary, I'm going to descend uh, on the left, in, into the left tree, right? And so in other words, 
from the very beginning, from the root of the tree, I'm making the wrong decision. So, <coughs> okay, fair enough, I'm going fast, but I'm going to get a neighbor here, which is going to be this one. So you may say, okay, so this is not so bad because the ratio between this distance and that distance actually is not so bad, so which is true. And actually, this will be even more true in higher dimensional spaces. It's the reason why I'll be talking about uh, distance concentration phenomena. And it's also the reason why actually people also consider that approximate nearest neighbor queries are often valid, right? Because uh, very often, again, even if you don't get the best peak, wh whatever you're going to get will be something decent. But still, if you want to be accurate and if you care for the nearest neighbor, this is not the right thing to do because you may be fooled from the very beginning. Okay, so if you want to fix, but still, so this is a definite search and as you will see, it will be uh, critical for one of the best solutions to, to spot nearest neighbors based on so-called random forest, actually. So we'll see that later. Okay. So now, the descending search. So the descending search, <coughs> so here it's a bit more complicated, but not so much. So what you want to do here is the following. So <coughs> um, you're going to visit either one or two subtrees, depending on the distance between the query point and the nearest neighbor, which has been computed so far, right? So in other words, so here is the algorithm. So you start from the root. So we also, we are going to maintain this quantity tau, which is a distance uh, between actually uh, the query point and the tentative nearest neighbor computed so far, right? And so let me maybe describe the idea from this drawing here. So what you are going to do is to, you, you maintain tau. Let's assume that uh, at some point I have computed the distance or my nearest, my, my best guess actually is uh, this nearest neighbor here, right? So my best guess is this nearest neighbor. And actually, as you can see, uh, with respect to this horizontal plane here, this nearest neighbor belongs to the bottom tree, to the tree, to the subtree storing this region. But it turns out that the distance between the domain associated with the right subtree, this upper region here, uh, again, the distance between the query point and the nearest neighbor, namely this distance here, this vertical distance here, this vertical drop, is less than the distance I have computed so far, which means that potentially my nearest neighbor could be sitting in this region too, right? And so when's the algorithm? If this turns out to be the case, if there is a risk to have the nearest neighbor sitting in this other subtree, then I also have to visit it, right? And of course, what is expected is that while traveling down the tree, this bound tau is going to get sharper. And so situations for which you will have to, to visit the two subtrees they're going to occur less and less often, right? So initially you start maybe visiting uh, at each iteration, this condition, these two conditions hold. So your sphere intersects the two domains, right? So it has to intersect one because the point is located somewhere, but potentially it intersects also the second domain in which case you descend. And at some point this is going to stop and, um, and, and then hopefully you'll be just traveling down the tree. So this is the descending search, which always returns the nearest neighbor at the cost of maybe doing some extra work uh, by visiting the two subtrees. And so in the worst case, there are pathological cases for which actually one visits the whole tree, unfortunately. Okay, so the third search algorithm is the so-called priority search, uh, where the idea is to store a priority queue <clears throat> actually to store candidate nodes to be visited in a priority queue with a priority which is going to be inversely proportional to the distance of the query point, right? I'm talking here about the distance between the query point and the region associated with a node of the tree, as uh, we previously considered in the, in, the, in the search we just discussed, right? And so what's going to happen is that upon getting a node from the priority queue, uh, we descend actually uh, to visit um, the node closest to Q, like in the definitive search, right? And upon descending, we update the nearest neighbor, right? And uh, again, so we descend on one side of the tree, and while we are descending, the child which is not visited is enqueued, right? And then possibly later, based upon the, b the, the bound on tau obtained, uh, obtained so far, will be actually recursing. So let me, let me show this more, more precisely. So here is the algorithm. So 
So we insert the root of the tree. So, and then we have this priority Q where we are popping a node from the Q. Okay, so let's call R the node which we get. Uh, we also assume that we are maintaining this bound tau. Uh, upon popping a node, if it turns out that a node has a region, and if it turns out that uh, uh, the distance between the query node and the box associated to the with, with the region is larger than tau, so then we are done with this node, and we are done for good because we are using a parity queue, meaning that all the remaining nodes enqueued uh, also satisfy, satisfy this bound. So, and then uh, if not, so we have to open the box, which means that, um, so we travel down defeatist style um, uh, starting from node R, right? And what are we doing then? So, um, for the nodes n on the path from the box we are, we are, we are, we are processing, um, yeah, so what we are doing, so we compute the distance between uh, the query point and the sample. So if uh, the, the sample associated with the node is less than the, the best guess which we have, we update the nearest neighbor, okay? And then what we have to do, uh, we, we have to, we compute, we, we, we process the, um, the further subtree associated with node R, right? And we enqueue that tree if this tree is of interest, namely if the, if the ball, if there is a chance for the ball centered at Q uh, and with distance actually to that box, if this, if this condition is less, if this distance is less than tau, right? Okay, so in that case we enqueue this box with a priority which is one over the distance, right? And so the smaller the distance, the higher the priority, but again, by enqueuing this, um, this region, it does not mean that it will be automatically uh, processed because, again, remember this condition, uh, this box is indeed placed in the priority queue, but once this box will be popped, we'll check whether this condition, which used to be true when the box was put in the queue, is still valid. Because, again, uh, much later, while processing the priority queue, the tau will be sharper, and this condition, which used to be uh, true here, might be false later on, right? And so this way we can actually adjust uh, <coughs> and try to optimize the number of boxes which are processed. Okay, so this is the priority search algorithm. So this one is going to, like the descending search, is going to return the exact nearest neighbor for sure, but again maintaining the priority queue might be a bit, uh, a bit costly. So, <coughs> if I try to, to recap on these strategies, so <coughs> uh, the parity search, so the nearest neighbor is always found, it has linear storage. The problem is that, practically speaking, if you try to monitor what's happening, is that the nearest neighbor is often found at some early stage, and then actually all these checks based on the parity queue are run, but the nearest neighbor does not improve, right? In other words, maintaining the queue has a cost. Okay. And um, when exactly the improvements which have been proposed by people trying to, both, uh, to improve things both from a practical standpoint and a theoretical standpoint, uh, again, so we have this definitely search which is very fast but which may fail. We have this uh, advanced priority search which is going to succeed for sure but which may be costly. And so people have tried to combine these two ideas and they came up with the ideas of randomized KD trees, which I'm going to present now. Okay, so <clears throat> there are several ideas which are of interest here. So, <clears throat> so this is the regular KD trees we have seen so far. So in a randomized KD tree, so the first thing is that uh, instead of uh, using uh, splits which are perpendicular to the axis, we'll be using splits perpendicular to random directions, okay? So here is one such uh, tree. And so <coughs> what I said earlier is that basically you were projecting points onto one axis and then taking the median at that axis. So here what you do, you pick a random direction on the unit sphere in your uh, ambient space. You project onto that direction, so what you see here, and then you compute the median of the, the projected points, right? So here point, four points to the left, three points to the right. And so actually we, we have a, a small jitter also which uh, which will be used for theoretical reasons to, to, for the analysis to work. 
But essentially, this is the idea, right? So you pick a random direction, you project, you take the median or a slightly shifted version of the median, and this is going to define your split, right? And now you have your, you have your two subtrees, and you're going to do the same. So on, on this example here, as you can see, so this is the first split, so this is level one, <coughs> level two splits, and so on and so forth. So this is a randomized KD tree. Okay, so here is a, a generic a version of the algorithm building such a tree. <coughs> so essentially what it does, so here I have embedded actually the notion of random direction and also actually a, a number beta, which is a parameter to adjust the split with respect to the median, right? Okay, so if beta is equal to actually one half, we are splitting exactly uh, at the median. If not, so here we are splitting between one fourth and well, between quartiles, one fourth and three th three fourth of uh, the size of the point cloud, right? So <coughs> again, so if you have too few points, so you, you you throw a leaf of your tree. If not, you pick a random direction. Okay, and so uh, you're going to project onto your direction, and so and and then if the pro so yeah, v is going is going to be your the, the beta fractile. So this number between 0 and 1, which is going to decide where the split is sitting. Again, if beta is equal to 1 half, so this is a median. And then you have a rule which states that um, if the dot product between the point and the random direction is less than beta, then you go to the left. If not, you go to the right. Okay. So this is actually uh, yeah, the left split rule. And if this inner product is uh, larger than v, so then the point goes into the right subtree. Okay and then you recurse, okay. Okay, so in passing, I'm going to throw one remark here, which is for those of you interested in points which are sitting, which are not filling uh, the entire space, but which are located maybe in a manifold, right? So there is some intrinsic dimension. So maybe you are talking about points in dimension 20, but they are sitting on a two-dimensional surface or more generally on a k-dimensional manifold. So, <coughs> Uh, in fact, so one reason for which I have beta here is this one. I wanted to mention this in passing. So if you build such a random uh, uh, projection tree, RP tree, here it can be shown, it's been done by Potuffet, actually that um, the diameter of cells of a tree built this way decreases down the tree at a rate which depends on the intrinsic dimension of the data. Right. So again, this is of potentially of interest if you have an assumption saying that your points do not fill the entire space, but you have some kind of uh, more intricate structure here. Okay, beta will play a role later also to analyze the performances of um, actually search methods uh, for random projection trees. But anyway, so as you can see, this is quite elementary, so we just have two numbers here, a random direction and a, a jitter here for the median. Okay, so now, in using this kind of tree, how can one improve the so-called defective search? So <coughs> there are two very interesting ideas here. The first one is, as I showed you earlier, one issue with the defective search occurs in particular if you are sitting near the boundary of the uh, domain, right? Because in that case, so you are sitting in one half space, you, you, you are going to descend on that side of the hyperplane, but because you are close from uh, the boundary, so your nearest neighbor is likely to be on the other side, okay? And of course, one easy way to fix this consists of allowing overlaps, actually, between the regions associated with the node of the tree, right? If instead of having a clear partition, when, instead, when you are throwing this hyperplane, if you actually have two domains, two half spaces which intersect slightly, so then you are going to fix somehow uh, issues with the definitive search whenever your query point is sitting near this overlap region. So this is actually the first thing which we are going to see. And the second interesting idea is related to actually uh, forests, so-called forests. Because if you're using a, a single random search tree, a random, well, RP tree, again, if you are making this definitive search, you may be full, right? But now, if you're using two search trees, built with different, uh, and these two trees, of course, will be implementing different spatial partitions because each of them is built at random, right? So if you are unlucky with the first three, so then the second one is likely to help, right? And so, again, if you are fooled, if you fail 
in finding the right neighbor with the first three because the partition, beca because your, your query point is located near a partition, near a boundary, and so you make the wrong decision. Because if, 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 if you have in stock different trees with different partitions, so then uh, for that, these trees, you will uh, actually probably descend on the right side. And so these are indeed the two ideas which are going to be extremely helpful to rescue the defeatist search, right? In other words, to make it efficient, the defeatist search is efficient time-wise, but using these, these tricks, actually, it will also become reliable in terms of nearest neighbors actually reporting. Okay, so let me uh, describe this with more details. So <coughs> it turns out that, so this is the median split we have heard about so far. So you split exactly in the middle. Mm -hmm. So this is a perturbed split I was talking about. So again, if a beta is equal to one half, you recover this situation. And this is this overlapping split I was describing where actually you want to tolerate some overlap between the regions associated with the nodes, yeah, with the children of, your, of a node, right? So here you will have maybe um, one, one half plus alpha uh, fraction of the points on the left entry, likewise on the right entry. And so here things are gonna be, near the boundary things are gonna be easier actually. Now, wh when we're talking about these splits, so here is a subtle thing somehow, it turns out that these splits can be used at two different stages, right? So you, you may use them to build the data structure or you may use them to run the query. So let me explain this more carefully. So spill trees are actually uh, randomized KZ trees where, uh, <coughs> okay, let me, okay, let, let, let's go through this table maybe. So in a random projection tree, what you're doing, so essentially if you split at the median or if you split at the perturbed split, if you're doing some kind of perturbed split. So when you are building the tree, so you're going to say, okay, this point is on the left, on the domain associated to, with one side of the upper plane, so it goes onto the left-hand side, right? So here you are going to each point, each, each data point is going to be stored exactly once. And when you are going to run your queries, defeatist style, of course, here, so you are going to, to visit the subtree associated with the domain containing your query point. So this is basically the regular random uh, KD tree or random projection tree I have described so far. In a spill tree, what you're doing, when you're routing the data, namely when you build the tree, you're using the overlapping split, which means that if a point is sitting in this region, it goes on the left-hand side only. If it's sitting in this region, it goes on the right-hand side. If it's sitting here, you're going to store this point in both subtrees which is going to induce some redundancy because as you can see, depending on the value of alpha, uh, some points are gonna be stored several times, okay? Okay, so again, so this is meant to fix queries located near this uh, region here. And so now you may try to be a bit smarter. You may say, okay, well, I would like to avoid uh, storing points several times, which occurs here. So maybe let's use a, med a median split, right? To build the tree, but at the query stage, when I'm going to run a query, maybe let's use, uh, let's use an overlapping split, which means that if you do so, you, you try to get the best of both worlds. So in doing so here, you will have a linear storage because the point is gonna be stored once, either on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. But uh, when running a query, if your point is located here, you're going to visit recursively actually the two subtrees, right? You see the point? Okay, so now let me give you some results. Okay. So <coughs> it can be shown that um, if you, depending on the value of alpha, which is being used actually, uh, the size of a spill tree has a bound which is this much, right? So for example, if you want, if alpha is 5%, so then you gain 15% in uh, memory storage, okay? So again, so this is up to, your, up to your standards, depending on the size of your database, uh, what you have in mind, etc. but you have to know it, okay? Uh, <clears throat> okay, what, what is going to come next is the analysis of the failure of uh, queries in spill trees. But uh, why do we need to analyze the failure of queries in spill trees? Because actually queries can still fail. So here is one example. So what's going to happen, we aim at fixing uh, queries in this area here, but still uh, we may face situation where uh, this uh, overlapping region uh, may not be sufficient. So here is one example. 
if uh, we have, let's, uh, let, let's look at a query point here, Q, which is exactly sitting here. I'm assuming that uh, here we are looking at things, projections of the data in one dimension, so at some, for some node of the tree. So this is a query point. So as you can see, um, it's been, um, in, again, so in a, in a spill tree. So when we build the data structure, we, we have this um, here in a spill tree. When we build the data structure, we have an overlapping split to, to source the data, but we have a median split to run the query. So <coughs> uh, because the query point is, is here, it's located on the right hand side of the median here. So query, query Q will be routed in the right subtree. And let's assume that it's the nearest neighbor is sitting here, namely just beyond actually the boundary of associated with the one plus alpha fractile. Okay, so because this point here is sitting outside the range associated with the overlapping split, actually this point has been routed upon building the data structure on the left hand side only, right? So in other words, the problem, the problem which we, we used to have here with uh, the, the, the boundary associated with the median, we, we have it now with the boundary associated with the overlapping range, right? Because again, so here, this point is found on the left subtree only, this point is routed at query time on the right subtree only, and as you can see, we are going to find some nearest neighbor in the right subtree here, and I'm assuming here that he's sitting here. So we are, fixi we are fixing things, we are improving things, but this is not actually uh, a perfect guarantee on the fact that it's going to succeed. Still, I'm going to present results on the performances of searches uh, carried out with a definitive search on spill trees or virtual spill trees. So here is actually an important slide, I think, because when one is running a nearest neighbor query, it's good to try to step back and to wonder how meaningful the nearest neighbors we are going to report are, right? So, and here is a function which aims at characterizing the difficulty of finding the nearest neighbor of a point Q. So let's go through the notations. So we have a data set P, P1 to Pn. We have a query point Q, and we are going to sort the points by increasing dis distance to point Q, okay? So P1 is the nearest neighbor, right? And P7 uh, uh, here is the, the, the point from the database which is furthest away, okay? And so now, uh, roughly speaking, we may face a number of situations. So if P1 is much smaller than the, well, the distance, um, okay, let, let's, let's look at this. If the distance, so this is the distance between Q and its nearest neighbor, right? And so here we are, we divide this quantity, we divide this quantity by actually the distances to the remaining nearest neighbors, right? From the second nearest neighbor to the nth nearest neighbor, right? And so now we have, and so we average. So this is the average, uh, ratio between distances uh, to the nearest neighbor versus distances to the remaining points. Mm -hmm. And so we have some extreme cases. If this is very, very small compared to that, so it means that point Q actually has a nearest neighbor and all the remaining points are far away, right? So in that case, you would expect a nearest neighbor query with respect to point Q to be very easy, right? Because essentially, uh, you throw Q, it has one point nearby, and the rest are very far away. So an easy case, right? As opposed to this, if all these ratios are equal to, are roughly equal to one or close to one, um, of course, so this is an ambiguous situation, right? Because you don't know whether you should return P1 or P2 or P3 or Pn, because all distances are equivalent after all, okay? And so this function phi tells us how difficult uh, the NN query with respect to Q is actually, right? And of course, what I'm going to present next are theoretical results which tell, which tell you how difficult uh, or how likely uh, nearest neighbor queries are to fail as a function of actually function phi, right? Okay, so hopefully the, you, you get the point here. We aim, at, we aim at analyzing uh, the difficulty and the likely, li likelihood of a failure as a function of the intrinsic difficulty of, uh, of the query itself. So I need to plug some more notations because, so this function phi, which I, I've just shown here, is defined with respect to the whole database, as you can see here. Okay, all points are involved. But uh, when I'll be presenting the theorems for um, a spill tree or a virtual spill tree, of course, the theorem will, will involve uh, all levels in the tree, 
And of course, for every internal node in the tree, we won't have the whole database, but we'll, we'll have a subset of the database. Whence this notation, um, actually. So <coughs> if we are assuming that we have m points out of n, okay, so um, for a cell containing m points, so function phi indexed by m is actually uh, this quantity, right? So again, we sort points uh, by increasing distance but for the points which are found in the cell, uh, in, in, in the cell we are processing only. It can also be generalized. I'm just showing this in case you would care for not first uh, nearest neighbor query, queries, but k nearest neighbor queries. Okay. And so now these are technical theorems, but so I'll give you the references if you want to take a closer look to, to these results. So, <clears throat> so this is a probability of uh, nearest neighbor search failure. Uh, for spill trees and uh, random projection trees. Mm -hmm. And again, so let me repeat this. So we need to analyze this because even though in one case uh, we are trying to fix uh, the nasty things which may occur near the boundary, so there is no guarantee that it's going to work in, in every single case. I showed you an example where it actually fails. And so here is the, the first theorem. So for spill trees, so we consider a spill tree whose depth is equal to this. Okay, this quantity, log in base one over beta, um, so there is an extra one here, sorry, of uh, this n divided by n naught. And beta, this is a jitter we use to actually, to, to implement, so for the, the, um, the, uh, the to implement the tree construction. Mm -hmm. So for spill trees and uh, one half for virtual spill trees because for virtual spill trees the overlapping split is only used at the routing stage. And so in that tree, the probability that the definitive search query does not return the exact first nearest neighbor is bounded by this quantity. Right? As you can see, it, it is a sum. It is a sum over all the levels of the tree because again, the definitive style search is visiting actually the tree from root to, to one leaf, right? And we have this function phi which is indexed here by this quantity beta to the i time n. And of course, beta to the i time n is the number of data points which are found uh, <coughs> at depth i in a given internal node of the tree. Okay. And so again, so this is, <coughs> as we have so, as we saw earlier, beta is a number, uh, phi, phi is a number between zero and one, right? And so again, it qualifies the difficulty, the intrinsic difficulty of the search when processing that node. Okay. So now there is an equivalent theorem for random projection trees. Um, and so this is a theorem. And so here what, what, what shows up is actually uh, phi log phi. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so this is a bit technical. So I'll give you the references. And so now you may say, sure, but uh, now give me numbers for actually phi and phi log phi. And so for that, actually, it's not really possible. We would have to plug more hypotheses to uh, to devise actually upper bounds on the value of phi and the value of phi log phi, essentially, depending on the geometry of the point set itself, right? Which has been done, actually. And you, in that paper, you can find actually such bounds uh, for specific hypotheses on the point cloud, for example, in the case of a doubling measure, which means that now we, we are throwing points at random according to some probability measure and we are making hypotheses on the probability measure itself. For example, the case which has been, one case which has been analyzed is the so-called doubling measure, namely the case where the probability mass grows polynomially in the radius of, the, of a ball. Okay. So there is a compromise between the probability of failure and the complexity of, so because we could just maximize uh, alpha to get a very small probability of failure, but then uh, the complexity Mm-hmm. Okay, but... Whether there is a compromise, so this is actually saying it's a compromise between uh, probability of failure and the complexity of the resulting uh, uh, RPT or... <coughs> so, so, look, so here, so, f okay, so first of all, we have, we have a compromise here between two things already, which is the size of the tree and the probability of failure, right? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. So you sort of you've been you were describing the essentially analyzing the difficulty of finding sure. the exact uh, near, near same area. Yeah. What I'm wondering about is sometimes um, 
well, thinking about the utility mm -hmm. or the cost to the application of getting the wrong one, it may be pretty low sometimes. Yeah. Like if you're I don't know, trying <coughs> to find the distance to the nearest 100 points or something yeah. like that, it doesn't really matter sure. very much. Yeah. So I'll comment on that later on. Okay. Yeah. OK, so I have to speed up a little bit. So <coughs> OK, so these are the references. So you'll get the papers. So in particular, this analysis has been carried out in actually this paper, randomized partition trees for exact nearest neighbor searches. Yeah, OK. OK, so now I'm going to run across uh, actually metric trees. And as you will see, this is a, an easy generalization of KD trees for metric spaces. OK, so first of all, so you all know, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. So what is a metric space? So we have these uh, properties which uh, must be fulfilled. OK, in particular of interest in this case is the triangle inequality. You will see why. Because in a metric tree, actually, we don't have a hyperplane which is splitting the embed space, but we'll be using spherical cuts, right? And um, in pruning a search in a metric tree, essentially, we'll be using the triangle inequality. OK. OK. So I'm going to, to give you, in, just in passing, in case you wouldn't know this, I'm going to give you a couple of interesting distances, right? So for example, the so-called house of distance, right? So here, why am I doing this? Because so you may be interested in using this to compare whatever models, for example, organs, right? The liver against the liver, right, maybe. So <coughs> the house of distance, here is a way, let, let's take a look to the picture, right? It's uh, more, it's easier than this complicated equation here. Uh, I apologize, so for some reason we don't see. So there is a bottom line here, right? So why? So do we have a piece of chalk, yes. So here is a figure, so this is y, this is x. So what I want to do is for, for, um, for, a, for a point y belonging to capital Y, I'm, I want to, to find the point y which is maximizing the distance to x, right? And so here it's going to be this one. Maybe let me call it y not, right? Y not is maximizing the distance to, to x, right? So now, so this is the so-called one-sided house of distance. So this is a maximum distance for a y belonging to capital Y of the distance between this y and a point from x. So now, if I compute this the other way around, where is the point uh, x not, which is maximizing the distance to y? So of course, it is this one, right, x not, because now the, this is a, the distance x not here is maximizing the distance from from any point of, of x to, to y. Okay, if in, if, uh, so in fact, because capital X and capital Y may be open sets, so here in the definition, one has to use uh, sup and f's, right? And once you have computed these uh, distances with respect to x naught and y naught, you take the maximum, right? And you, and you have the house of distance, right? So this is the other distance. This is especially convenient. It's like a worst case distance, which can be used to compare two geometric shapes. OK. OK. So another interesting distance you may care for, uh, and actually which we use for molecules, for example, is the so-called least root mean square deviation, RMS, least RMSD. So here is the way it goes. So we are considering two point sets. Uh, actually, this point set, they have the same size. And I'm also assuming that I have a one-to-one -one matching, right? AI is matched with BY, BI and I know, uh, actually, it's like, uh, I, I know this matching, right? And so to define the least RMSD here, I need to define, actually, what, what we call the RMSD. So we have these two uh, point sets, A1. OK, so, uh, ah, sorry, so I, I got it wrong here. So A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. OK, B1, B2, B3, B4, B5. Sorry about the notations. And so the RMSD root, as the name suggests, root mean square deviation between uh, the two point sets is actually the square root uh, of the length of the vectors, right? So when I'm matching AI to BI, I compute the square length, right? I average, I, take, I average, and I take the square root. So this is the root mean square deviation. So now, if you are given two point sets, and uh, if uh, you want to compare them regardless of positions and orientations, right? In other, one, in, 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 in other words, you want to caution out by the group of uh, rigid motions. So what you want to do is to compute this. 
you want to the least root mean square deviation, namely the minimum over rigid motions. So this is a special Euclidean group, SE3, of the root mean square deviation between A and B modified by any rigid motion, right? Okay. And so this is a root mean square, least root mean square deviation. And interestingly, it boils down to computing uh, SVD in dimension three. So it's very easy. So you, you have two papers here where this is shown. These are classical papers. And so this is also an interesting uh, method to compare point clouds, assuming that uh, actually they have the same size and that you have a, a matching. Now, if they don't have the same size and if you don't have the matching, so typically you'll be facing NP-complete problems. So some work has been done on this too, but this is an, an interesting entry point to compare point clouds. Okay, so now I told you that I wanted to, to run uh, nearest neighbor searches in metric spaces. So um, we'll be using a number of properties related to the triangle inequality. So I recall them here. So these are simple manipulations. So if you have three points uh, belonging to your metric space, so, okay, so this is the direct triangle inequality. This is the reverse triangle inequality. So if you want to prove this, for example, you, you have all done that. So actually you, you apply the triangle inequality three times by plugging uh, whatever point here, DQ, you, you compute, yeah, you have three points, you, you write this uh, three times uh, for the three pairs of points here, and you, you will end up with uh, the lower bounds. So now, uh, if you have a point set um, P, it turns out that uh, because this holds, so you can, this also holds with respect to any point in the point set P, and so this is uh, an inequality which is of the same type. Okay, so maybe keep this one in mind because we'll be using it, we'll be using it later, right? Okay, so metric trees. So in a metric tree, it's, it's basically like a KD tree, except that we are going to, to use, as I said, spherical cuts, which means that we are going to build a binary tree and um, associated with a node of the tree, we'll have a so-called pivot, okay? And we also have a distance to the pivot, so we'll have to, to compute this, right? And so now what's going to happen? So as you can see, this pivot with this distance, so these two quantities are going to define a sphere, right? And so the left sub subtree will consist of points falling into the sphere, and the right subtree will consist of points falling outside the sphere, right? And so as you can see, as opposed to KD trees where we were projecting points onto a line, sorting them, computing the median, here we just care for distances, no embedding anymore. <clears throat> and so we are going to do this recursively, right? And so here is what a uh, metric tree looks like in dimension two. Now you have replaced again the hyperplanes by actually uh, spherical cuts. Okay, <clears throat> so there is a key property. So of course, in a KD tree, uh, so we, when searching a KD tree, we were trying to visit uh, one subtree only. So here is the same holds. And so we need to find a rule to actually prune the search, namely say, okay, uh, given what we have found so far, uh, so visiting the left subtree is enough, or the visiting the right subtree is enough. So this is a simple property which is required here. So <coughs> as usual, we are assuming that a, nearest, uh, a guess x for the nearest neighbor of q has been reported, right? And so we call the distance tau. And then, so we have these two rules. It turns out that upon entering a new node n, if the distance between the query point and the pivot is at least actually the radius of the ball associated with the pivot plus the best guess uh, found so far, then the left subtree can be ignored. And so we have a similar rule for the right subtree. Okay, so actually it's not very difficult to see why it works. So we are just using this first, uh, this lower bound inequality which we saw on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. And so you want to show that, uh, if, if, if I, let's take a look to this condition here. We want to, to show that we can skip the left, left subtree. So in other words, we want to show that if we pick any, remember the left subtree consists of points such that the distance between the pivot and such a point is strictly less than mu, okay? So we want to show that the distance between the query point and any data point found in the left subtree is more than tau because again, tau is the distance which we have uh, found so far for the best guess, right? We want to show this. So we start from this lower bound. DQS is uh, at least as, as large as this, okay? 
but uh, okay so we are going to use uh, actually properties on these two quantities so by hypothesis the distance between the query point and q is at least this so this is the hypothesis right and uh, we are also assuming that s is located within this sphere right okay i said s is located in the left surface tree when uh, the distance between the pivot p and s is less than u or if you multiply by minus one you get this and now if you add up these two quantities you get this so it's, it's pretty easy right so <coughs> this is a way if you can build such a tree so you have a way using distances condition on distances to actually prune out the the search and visit one subtree only so now you may say how do i find the pivot and how do i uh, set up this quantity mu so here is one way to do it so i actually so now i'm not going to describe these uh, algorithms uh, in detail anymore because they are essentially those which we saw earlier for kd trees right essentially um, essentially so you want to assign points to the to the for, for to the left subtree, points to the right subtree, you want to recurse. So the condition, wh what matters here is the way you are building actually the pivot and the way you are computing the, the median. And so one classical way to do it is the following. So uh, let's assume, let me call S the point set to be processed to build a node at some, uh, at some intermediate stage of the construction. So one is going to, we are going to pick a subs at random a subset Q belonging to S, and we are going to pick at random a point V belonging to Q. So this random point will be the pivot. Now, since we have a pivot, we are going to compute all distances between the pivot V and the point P be which belong to this random subset, right? And of course, if we hope, if we expect the point Q to be representative of the wall point set S, right? So this set of distances here is expected to reflect the distances between V and the point set, the point set S itself, right? And so we'll be defining the median mu as the median of the distances associated with the pivot and the random subset Q. Okay. And uh, okay, so this can be analyzed. And if we do so, uh, if everything goes well, if you can find a pivot which is partitioning your point set into two subsets of equal size, then of course you are in good shape because you, your uh, metric tree is going to be balanced. Okay, so I'm skipping this. It's essentially uh, uh, a repetition of what I said earlier. It's about applying this lower bound condition to prune the, the search in a metric tree. And now one observation here is the following. So. So we have two things, right? We have the shape of the tree, which is going to condition its height, and we also have the probability of failure. And so regarding the probability of failure, it's interesting, there is an interesting observation, which is the following one. So if you remember here, when I discussed this little property, <coughs> so look, so the condition which we have here, uh, we are going to prune the tree, we are going to prune the search, actually. Um, uh, so if we take a look to this figure, uh, if tau if tau is small, we are going to actually prune the search. Um, yeah, what do I want to say here? <coughs> if tau tau is a distance is the best guess. Yeah, uh, if tau is small, we are going to prune the search as soon as the distance between the pivot and the query point is larger than mu plus tau. So in other words, for tau small. What matter is the length of the sphere which is bounded, or the measure of the sphere which is defining this spherical cut, right? Okay, whence this observation, actually, which I'm, I'm not formalizing here, I, I'm just giving you an example. So here is a case in 2D where, uh, so we have the unit square with unit measure. And here we have three circles, okay? one uh, and okay three circle arcs one here and one there and so this circle and the two circle arcs they are dividing the plane the, the unit square into regions of equal size one half right which means that <coughs> you could take again to build a balanced search tree a balanced metric tree you may use this spherical cut in which case you would get okay this inner circle on the left subtree and the complement on the right subtree or you may, and in both cases, so you would have one half of the mass and one half of the mass. 
you may use this uh, circle arc here and again you would have uh, one half of the mass and one half of the mass. So in terms of shape of the tree, it's going to be the same. So now what about, since uh, the three trees which we can build using these three cuts here are balanced, they are perfectly balanced, which one is best to minimize the probability to have, uh, to, to, to minimize the, or to maximize the probability of pruning the tree? So because of the previous remark, actually what we want to do is to minimize the length actually of the boundary between the regions. So, uh, okay, again, right? So <coughs> for when tau is small, this condition is going to apply uh, near the boundary, right? Okay. Okay, and so, yeah. So here we have three chases for the pivot, so as to split the unit square into two regions of equal, equal size. And if we compare the length of the boundaries, so if we split at PC, the boundary is 125. So this is the best case. And if we split at, uh, if we use as a pivot PM, the length of the boundary is 2.5. And this is the worst case in order to, this is a case for which um, actually we are going to, we won't be able to apply the pruning rule most often. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this was for uh, metric trees. And now the last piece of uh, machinery is the notion of metric forest. Because again, um, <coughs> if you want to use a defeatist style strategy, so you may be fooled by one tree, but if you build several trees, actually, uh, because they will have different partitions, they will implement different vertical cuts. Actually, the defeatist size search may fail for one tree, but may work for another one. And so this is a notion of metric forest. And as you can see, what you are going to do maybe, and so in experiments, people are typically using between 10 and 20 different metric trees. And so again, each metric tree has a different partition. And uh, what you're doing, you run defeatist style, your query in a given metric tree, you collect your nearest neighbor, you do the same here, and eventually you pick the best amongst all the nearest neighbors found for your 10 or 15 or 20 trees. And this is your proposal for your nearest neighbor. And now remember one of these uh, first slides I showed you when comparing the accuracy of uh, nearest neighbor searches for uh, ANN, uh, LSH, uh, metric trees, uh, KD trees, etc. It turns out that this, this is possibly uh, one of the most uh, effective solution, interestingly. Okay, so these are references. So the first paper which introduced metric trees, right? Uh, and then, well, a, num a number of them. So I, I let you investigate. Okay, so time is flying by. So I want to say a few words about the earth mover distance. So that would be pretty easy. So I'm not, I'll not be covering the details, but I think it's of interest for those of you um, actually willing to compare images in particular. So the motivation comes from, well, initially, the comparison of histograms, right? If you, if you are given two histograms, so like here, maybe this one and that one. Okay, so essentially, so to compute histograms, you have many, many ways to define metrics on histograms. So broadly speaking, so there are two broad classes of uh, distances. So some of them are bin to bin, right? So bin, in a bin to bin fashion, you are going to, if, if, if we assume that we have the same number, number of bins, we, we are on common grounds. So basically you, you are going to, yeah, you, to compute, for example, this quantity here, right? And the bad thing here, as you can see, is that if you slightly shift, if you shift but one histogram by one unit, and if it's exactly the same, you are going to, well, your measure is going to be oblivious to the fact that it's just a shifted histogram. So too bad for you. So it's essentially the same, but you can see it. So as opposed to this, you have mixing uh, distances, which for example, may use a quadratic form. And so in this way, what you're going to do, you have a full matrix and you, you compare every bin with every bin, right? And so this is the other extreme, right? And so if you read these papers, so you, you have references also at the end, here, one reads that here you, you overestimate the distance and here you underestimate the distance. Okay, so how can we fix this? So this is the idea of the earth mover distance, which is a neat uh, quantity. So to define it, we are going to consider two point sets. So we have points or, so here you may think bins, right? 
okay, P1, PM, etc. And uh, we have two such, and this is a weight, like, uh, yeah, maybe for an histogram, yeah, so the height of the bars associated with the locations. Okay, so this is point, point set P and point set Q, okay. And so we'll be calling the total masses WP, the sum of the WPI and WQ, the sum of WQJ, okay. And uh, we'll also assume that we have a, a, a distance between the points themselves, right? So in particular, I can compare the distance between PI and QJ. So we may represent this as a bipartite graph. So this is my representation of the nodes of this graph. So for, uh, okay, for P, again, so I have a PI and point PI, which has an embedding, I maybe coordinates. Uh, has a weight W of PI, okay, and likewise for Q. So now what is a transport plan between P and Q? It is a set of quantities, we call them flows, which are circulating along the edges of the bipartite graph P times Q, right? And so here I'm saying that the quantity Fij is actually taken from PI and sent to Qj. And of course, Fij, so these are non-negative flows, and actually Fij has to be, uh, is upper, bounding, upper, upper bounded by the minimum of WPI and WQJ. You may see this actually as a, um, um, how should I put it? Um, as a, you are transported, you, you transport facilities, right, somehow. So, here you have some production. If the PIs are factories, they are producing goods, right? And so here these are shops selling goods. So here, so you have a total production, W of PI. Here you have a consumption, WQJ. And so here this factory is going to export uh, FIJ of its production to this shop, right? So this is another way to see this, okay? So this is a setting. And so now what is the so-called earth mover distance? So again, uh, seen in this way uh, by factories and shops. So when you're going to ship FIJ from the factory to the shop, you're going to pay a price, which is uh, the quantity which is being shipped times the distance, right? Which is fair. And so when the functional, which you want to minimize, actually, you want actually to assign, where is my laser? Gone. Okay, so you, what you want to do is to compute a transport plan, which is going to dis distribute the production from the factories uh, to the shops. And because again, when you ship FIJ from, a factory, from factory I to the shop J, so you pay uh, a price which is linear in the quantity and the distance. So overall, you want to minimize this under a number of constraints. So first of all, uh, the FIJs must be positive. So a factory cannot export more than it produces. A shop cannot uh, receive more than it sells, right? And uh, overall, um, the sum of um, the flows is bounded by the minimum of the production and, and of the consumption, okay? So, of course, this is a so-called linear program, right? So what you're seeking here what do we seek? We seek the quantities Fij. All the rest is defined, okay? And so, uh, because this is a linear program, it can be solved in cubic time, okay? By, let's say, interior problem methods or by using the simplex method, which may, run, may take more time, okay? And once you have computed these uh, quantities here, uh, you can actually compute the so-called earth mover distance, which is uh, a normalization of the cost divided by the sum of the flows, okay? And of course, you can apply this in a number of settings, right? It's just a linear program defined from uh, two point sets for which you have a distance between the ground spaces, okay? So here is uh, an illustration to the comparison of images. So again, I'll give you the reference later on. So, well, I'm not going to describe this in detail. If you read this paper, you will see that, um, so what is done here is an image is converted to an histogram you, you using either a fixed binning of the color, of the color space or using actually a clustering of the pixels into certain clusters. And then if you, uh, you have a database of, I think it's 20,000, 20, yeah, 20,000 images, 
And so you pick an image at random, you, you run queries, and of course, if you throw a car, you expect to see a red car, you expect to see a red car or something resembling. And so you can do this with different metrics. And uh, if you look at uh, the outcome, so it turns out that so this is what you, you see uh, uh, using the L1 distance, using this uh, quadratic form distance, and using EMD. So it, it, it turns out the results are more convincing for EMD. Okay. So here I had a connection with uh, the so-called Mallow's distance in statistics. So I'm going to skip this because I would like to say a few words about distance concentration phenomena. Uh, but essentially it tells you that to compute, to, to compare two distributions, actually in the discrete case uh, and in the continuous case also, this is actually uh, like the earth mover distance. Okay. Okay. So these are the references. So this is one paper Computer scientists, computer scientists like very much, actually, or describing this, actually. Uh, yeah, so, no, so this is the first paper I wanted to talk about, so by Leo Gibas and others. So this is the one making connection between the EMD and Mallow. So this is an application of the Earth mover distance to compare clusterings, right? So often one can cluster data using different strategies. So it turns out that you can use EMD to compare clustering schemes. And I'm also mentioning this one of potential interest, where we have shown that, um, uh, in fact, in the EMD, you compare the points uh, and the masses. Now, if the points are connected, namely, if on the left-hand side you have a graph structure, and if so on the right-hand side you also have a graph structure, you can combine the earth mover distance and graph theory in, o in order to compute a transport plan, which is also going to respect connectivity. Right? In other words, you want to transport a graph into a graph. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to conclude in a few minutes. I won't be going into the details to leave time to questions, but uh, actually I wanted to mention this, uh, this problem of uh, measure concentration. Okay, so where should I go in order to, to convey the message without spending much time? Um, may maybe here, yeah. Okay, so <coughs> maybe let's focus in dimension D on the Euclidean norm. So here is a setup. So we are in a d-dimensional space, and uh, we are looking at a random vector. Uh, okay, so we are looking at random vectors here. Okay, this is this is the way it goes. Okay, so we fix a one-dimensional distribution, and we are looking at such actually random vectors, right? Namely, a random vector such that each component has a prescribed one-d distribution, and then we are going to compute the in the Euclidean case, we are going to compute the Euclidean norm of this quantity. And of course, we could compute it for different LP norms with P different than 2. Okay? So here is maybe a very interesting slide. So <coughs> if you do so, we are going to plot. So this is a dimension. So here, low dimension. D ranges from 1 to 10. And here, D ranges from 10 to 100. Right? And so what we have here is because we are uh, taking such a, I don't know how many points were taken in this paper. So they took uh, maybe 10 to the 4 random points and they computed, okay, so, so they are plotting here, so how many, 3, 6 curves. So <coughs> the Euclidean norm, okay, so our random, if we, the random vector, the random, again, so ra the random vector has components here. So in that case, uh, on the next slide, they are uh, the, the calligraphic F, they are random variables between 0 and 1, okay? Which means that the, the L2 norm of a random vector ranges from in between 0 and square root of M, right? All right for everybody? If we, if we have such a random vector and if each Xi ranges in between 0 and 1, it means that the minimum Euclidean norm is 0 and the maximum Euclidean norm is 1 is square root of m, square root of d, sorry, square root of d, okay. Okay, so what we have here is uh, actually, uh, I think, the minimum Euclidean norm observed, and here the maximum, okay, observed on the point cloud which has been used. Of course, the minimum is zero, and the maximum is square root of d, okay. Okay, so again, minimum possible value, maximum possible value, minimum value observed, maximum value observed. And what we find in the middle, actually, is the average, the expectation, and the average plus and minus the standard deviation. 
Okay. Okay. All right for everybody. Okay. So now, what do we observe here? So several things. So <coughs> if the dimension is small, it turns out that what we see is that basically the smallest value observed is not so far from the minimum possible value, which is zero. And likewise here, even, even though the gap widens, the maximum value observed is not so far from the maximum possible value, square root of d. Okay. So this is, these are the first two observations. And then the other observations are that actually it turns out that uh, this, this tube here seems to have a constant width, right? Namely, whatever the dimension, whatever the dimension, it turns out that um, yeah, the gap between uh, the observed value and the observed value plus minus uh, the standard deviation remains the same. So this is again, so this gap seems to be constant. Okay, so now let's go to higher dimensions. In fact, from D ranging from 10 to 100, so now what do we see? This gap used to be small, even though it was widening uh, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, and here this is confirmed, this trend is confirmed here the gap between the minimum value observed and the minimum possible value widens, and so does the gap between the maximum value observed and the maximum possible value, right? As opposed to this, uh, here, uh, this uh, tube uh, still has the same width, right? Okay, so this is not completely at random, so now these are the theorems, which tell you that <coughs> under my assumptions, is x is a random vector with id components, right? So then there exists constants such that the expectation of the L2 norm of such a random vector has this form, right? And, and this is the, 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 the expression for the variance, right? So in other words, so the variance is small with respect to the expectation, right? Mm -hmm. The error which you are making using the expectation instead of the norm itself become, becomes negligible, right? So in other words, it looks like the points are on a sphere of radius, the expectation of the L2 norm of the expectation of the L2 norm of the vector, right? And actually this holds here the XI are not independent. So this is a kind of result which we call concentration, because here the, the distances tend to concentrate around actually the expectation. So what does it mean for nearest neighbors? Well, this is actually another way to, to see things, and so it's time is over, so I'm almost done, but uh, maybe, yeah, let me define these quantities and let me conclude with one slide. So <coughs> for nearest neighbors, of course, when you are searching a nearest neighbor, so I had the question several times, so you, a couple of times maybe, so you're going to report, to report one guy, but uh, you could have maybe reported another one and uh, it would have been possibly the same. Also, remember that whenever we discussed these pruning strategies uh, when searching KD trees or metric trees, we had this tau quantity, which was monitoring our ability to prune the search, right? And depending on the, the value of tau, so, so this value of tau was conditioning the, actually the exploration of uh, both sides of the tree. And so in fact, to try to understand exactly what's happening, it's interesting to look at quantities such as the contrast and the absolute contrast and the, and, and the related constraints of the, in databases. So <coughs> if we look at uh, random vectors, like realization of our random vector x, right? And so of course you have maybe, you have 10 to the four points and you are sitting at the origin and let's compute, uh, let, let's compute d max, which is a maximum norm observed and d mean, which is the maximum, minimum norm, right? And so we call this the absolute contrast. Namely, in other words, seen from the origin, it's the width of the annulus which is containing all your database, okay? And now you may normalize the width of this annulus by actually the inner radius, in which case you define the uh, relative contrast. And of course, <coughs> So this is uh, clearly an important notion because if, you, if your query point is sitting at the origin, of course, so the, the magnitude of this annulus tells you how different the points are when you are using the L2 distance here, right? If you have, if this annulus is large, it means that when you are going to run a nearest neighbor query, you'd better pick a, a point near the inner shell, right? 
And again, if you have a, a large gap between this inner shell and this outer shell, which are defined respectively, respectively by the minimum distance with respect to the origin and the maximum distance, what it means, so now back to the function phi, which I use to analyze queries for random projection trees. So if you have a large gap, it means that the uh, nearest neighbor search query is going to be easy because it's easy to disentangle uh, what is the nearest neighbor and uh, uh, the nearest neighbor versus uh, another point which is uh, further away. As opposed to this, if the contrast is vanishing, so it means that the distance or the norm you're using cannot distinguish anymore between the nearest neighbor and the remaining ones. Right? Whence the importance of these notions. So now to conclude, maybe let me show you this kind of uh, results which can be found in the literature. So <coughs> under the usual assumptions, if we are talking uh, of Minkowski norms, namely LP norms for actually P at least equal to one. So one can find this kind of theorems which tell you that essentially um, if you care for the absolute contrast, again, so you, you consider realization of your random variable and the width of the annulus which is containing these points. So the expectation of this uh, contrast normalized by the dimension divided one over p minus one half. So this is bounded by two quantities, right? So this is a constant and this is a constant multiplied by the, num the number of points minus one. So let's take a look to this depending on the value of p. p being the value defining your LP norm, right? So in fact, if you, let's start by the L2 norm because this is the norm we took a look to. As you can see here, it, this tells you that essentially the absolute contrast is equal to a constant, which is actually what we saw earlier. Right? And as you can see, if you are using the L3 norm, the contrast is actually vanishing. So then if you were to use the L3 norm, LP norm with P is equal to three, so then uh, actually, um, nearest neighbor queries are getting very hill condition because in fact there is no, for the L3 norm, there is no contrast anymore between uh, the points you have drawn seen from the origin. Right? So now if you are using a L1 norm, you have larger contrast. So this is just one example to show you that depending, so here we are talking about, so this is a simple setting, realization of random vector whose components are IDs actually. And depending on the LP norm you are using, so the width of the annulus which is containing your realization is going to vary a lot from zero to something growing as a dimension and being constant with L2 norm. So this is just a warning to tell you that when you are using distances, be careful. So you may face this kind of uh, situation, namely you may be using a distance which is actually meaningless. You may be struggling and fighting to report a nearest neighbor, but in fact, if you, if you don't have any contrast for your objects and your distance, it's actually, you should pick a point at random, actually. It, that would be equally efficient. And so this is maybe the last slide to conclude. So if you wanted to be pragmatic, if you wanted to run nearest neighbor query from a given point, you'd better make sure, for example, run a sanity check and for example, make sure that from your query point, check that the distances are possibly bimodal. So if when you are sitting here and if you are looking at distances, for example, between me and all of you, so if I was plotting the histogram of distances from me and all of you, I would possibly get something like this, right? Um, okay, something, a continuum of distances. So in that case, what is the nearest neighbor? Well, that's dubious, right? If as opposed to having a situation where I don't have any separation distances, I have maybe two modes, I can certainly say, okay, these are my nearest neighbors and then the rest, they are sitting further away. So be critically minded. So if you don't have any contrast, distances are meaningless and so are nearest neighbor searching algorithms, letting alone the complexity of the queries themselves, because I, as I showed you, uh, you may eventually face this situation where even if you have small data structures, because you don't have any contrast, you, would be, you will be ending up exploring the whole data structure itself. Okay, sorry, I took a few more minutes. Uh, so this was maybe one another example where actually, so this is for molecules uh, in dimension, I don't remember, uh, I don't remember the dimension, a few, maybe 12 amino acids. So we have at least 24 torsion angles. So we are in dimension between 20 and 30. And so here, so we have generated 50,000 conformations. And so we have computed the histogram in red of distances between every pair of conformations. 
And interestingly here, it turns out that for small distances, what we have is essentially, so this is written here, um, this is a zoom. So this is a distribution of all pairwise distances. For small distances, it turns out that what we have are uh, actually, it's a, a piece, so look at this. This region here, this is like uh, a piece of, Gauch of isotropic Gaussian in dimension 24, right? And what we have on the right hand side, somewhere here, is actually like a uniform, uh, the histogram of distributions between all pair of points drawn according to uniform distribution in dimension 24, right? So in this case, if you're considering all pairwise distances, it turns out that the interesting region in this curve is in between here and there. The rest is an artifact actually of the dimension. And so we have concentration here and there. So B critically minded. References again, and so to, just to conclude, so these problems are in general non-trivial. So one faces difficulties with respect to the dimension and also to the meaning of distances. A lot of research has been done, both on the theoretical side and on in the engineering side, so side to maximize distances. And those often the simplest data structures are, seem to be those which work best. And there is still one question which is not properly answered to my taste, is uh, that of dynamic point clouds. Should you be adding or removing actually points from your database? Because the data structures I talked about are static. Okay. <laughs> so we are almost, we are a little bit past my time, but uh, if there is any question, one short question. Sure. Yes. Yeah. You talked about uh, you limit dimension uh, uh, forests. Yes. Uh, now, if you have, you have a forest with a uh, uh, number of uh, trees which look identical, so same uh, alphabet or something like that, mm -hmm. how does the number of, uh, how does the probability of failure scale with the, with the size of the forest? <coughs> So it's true that what I'm aware of are results uh, which give the um, probability of failure for a given tree, but not for that of the forest. Now, now uh, the trees are built independently, so it shouldn't be too difficult to work out a bound for the forest, given that the trees are independent. Right? So that's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, Otherwise, I... I have just a short one. Yep. Any recommendation for a library which uh, implements these kind of structures really efficiently? Um, <coughs> so for KD trees, you have several options uh, like um, FLAN, uh, yeah, F L A L N. I think it stands for Fast Approximate Nearest Neighbor Algorithms. Okay. So you have the library for A N N. Uh, you have that by David Mount. Uh, yeah, it's called A N N. For metric trees and metric forests, so I'm not aware of. Um, any really official distribution. On the other hand, it's, uh, as you have seen, you have the pseudocode on the slides, so it's really yeah. elementary. So, okay. so for ANN is a bit, uh, a, the interest of ANN is, so this is maybe a possibly more complicated uh, construction with guarantees in the worst case. So that might be worth uh, using, it might be worth using this one, but for metric trees and metric forests, so, so this is one of the lines of code, interestingly. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's thank again Frederick. And now it's a coffee break and at 11 we have...